What's your overall reaction to the, he- the headlines that we've seen so far? Well, it's sensational. And I must have say I predicted it because I thought that for the $20 million that Random House paid, they wanted a lot for their money and they've got it. It's, uh, it's explosive, it's hugely damaging to the British royal family and to Britain's reputation. And just as the latest in the salvos from the Sussexes, starting with Opera Winfrey, then the Netflix series, newspaper interviews, podcasts, and now this. And it can only get worse. It's hard to imagine how, uh, because some of the headlines here are so ungracious about his brother, the future King of England, his father, the sitting King of England. He wants you to believe his father is an unfeeling jerk who on the day he was born declared great to to Princess Diana. Now I have an heir and a spare. My job here is done. That when he told the boys that Princess Diana had died, he went into their room. Uh, William was uh, 14, I think, and Harry was 12. And uh, that when he told them, my dear boy, your mom has died. She's been in a car accident. He didn't even hug Prince Harry. I mean, he clearly wants us to see his father as a cold, just cold-hearted fish. Well, first of all, how would he know what uh, Prince Charles, as he then was, said to Diana on the day of his birth? I mean, that's ridiculous. He's got no evidence for that at all. And as for the uh, the way in which he was told that about the death, I mean, it was traumatic. Eyewitnesses disagree with that interpretation. I think more interesting about their relationship is Charles apparently joking, in inverted commas, with Harry, that perhaps Charles is not Harry's father. And that, I think, as I raised in my book, there is this uh, story. It's not to do with a man called Hewitt, who's an army officer who did have an affair with um, Diana. It's about an unknown or unnamed lover that Diana had between the two births. And uh, that has always been a subject of contention uh, that uh, Prince Charles or King Charles is not really Harry's father, which Harry has now brought up. Um, You know, this is really hugely explosive and very damaging for the royal family. And what does it say about about Harry? I mean, what a traitor. uh, Exactly. Well, I'll get to that in one second. But on the subject of uh, Prince Charles and this joke, he says, oh, this is a remarkably unfunny joke, given the rumor circulating that my actual father was one of Mummy's former lovers, Major James Hewitt. And he goes on to say that's because of his flaming ginger hair. But he says another cause of this rumor was sadism. And he says, never mind that my mother didn't meet Major Hewitt until long after I was born. Okay, so this is a rumor that we all read in the tabloids. He does look like Hewitt, but you're saying the timing didn't work out and there, well, there may have been another it, it, lover. But but just to finish the point, I, uh, as a parent, this is what you do. Because the full context, he says that the father was saying, who knows if I'm really the Prince of Wales? Who knows if I'm even your real father? He's showing him that humor is a way to deal with these nasty rumors, that he could laugh at himself. Who knows if I'm really the prince? And who knows? It, it's a it's a gift. He's trying to train his child to deal with the negative press, something clearly Harry to this day refuses to learn. Well, that's one interpretation. But I mean, I think it's far worse. I think he is sowing seeds of doubt in every direction he can. And uh, whether it's about his cocaine habit, killing 25 Taliban, he now claims, um, all these allegations of the fight with William, which is bizarre because the photograph of Nottingham Cottage, where he allegedly fell and hurt his back breaking the dog water bowl, the water bowl is made of metal. And then Meghan apparently telling uh, Kate that she's got baby brains, I mean, the point about all this is that Meghan was intent on establishing her own domination in the royal family. And when that didn't work, and she finally decided, or early decided, she was going to leave, she uh, opted for revenge against those who didn't give what Meghan wants. As Harry famously said, what Meghan wants, Meghan gets. And she's getting it now. It is, she Mm. is, all my research shows, that throughout her career, she has been an agent of destruction. And she is very cleverly now, through Harry this time, and undoubtedly there'll be a Meghan book too one day, 
sowing destruction amongst the royal family. I mean, this is very, very damaging stuff and explosive. The lack of accountability of taking any responsibility for his role in any of this is remarkable on Prince Harry's part. He he doesn't, in any form that we've seen in the leaked excerpts, say, I had a role in it too. And the the argument of, that he had with Prince William at Nottingham Cottage, Cottage in 2019 is a perfect example. I'll take the viewers through what was r- s- weirdly, suddenly leaked to The Guardian, a left-wing w- newspaper that Dan Wooden, our friend and r- uh, reporter at GB News, points out, wants to abolish the monarchy. So it's pretty interesting. This excerpt was very clearly leaked to The Guardian uh, by Prince Harry's people. That's my supposition. It's not proven. Um, He talks about a 2019 fight scene, okay, where it was his London home, 2019, where Harry says, William called Meghan difficult, rude, and abrasive, which Harry then said was a parroting of the press narrative and that he expected better of Prince William. He says, Prince William grabbed me by the collar, ripping my necklace. Why was he wearing a necklace? Some of us would like to know. Okay, Tony, Tony Windsor. (laughs) He grabbed me by the collar, ripping my necklace, and knocked me to the floor. He says, that resulted in a visible injury to his back because he landed on a dog bowl that then shattered. I don't know what kind of dog bowl he's got. Most of us have plastic dog bowls. Okay, that can't cut cut up your back, but whatever. He's a Windsor, so perhaps it's made of, you know, glass. I don't know. Um, that William had come over there in the first place to talk about, quote, the whole rolling catastrophe and arrived, quote, piping hot. To me so far, Tom, this tells us William was angry behind the scenes. He was angry at Harry and Meghan for a reason, but the reason goes unaddressed. Harry just puts it all on William's anger and how he was this poor victim who, after allegedly being grabbed by the collar and shoved down by his big brother, doesn't fight back this, this guy who killed 25 Taliban, as he claims, doesn't, you know, shove his brother back, doesn't, you know, tell him to get the hell out and then go talk to his wife. He called his therapist. He called his counselor, which I'm sorry, but feels the whole thing incredibly emasculating for this guy who clearly wants us to see him as a tough guy. Well, uh, and, and, and raises so many questions. I mean, we don't know whether he hit him back or not. But at that stage in 2019, Uh, William had good cause to be furious with Meghan and Harry. They had, after all, uh, bullied their staff who had submitted many complaints. They clearly were intent on leaving. All the fears that William, Charles and the whole family had had about Meghan had come true. She was, she'd leaked by then uh, to the People magazine her complaints and the letter to her father. She had started a legal action. She clearly was being, a, a, as I say, an agent of destruction. And William went across there because he was furious. And as you rightly say, Harry doesn't say whether he's guilty or not. But we know that by then Harry was equally intent on leaving. He was delighted by the thought of going to California. It was just a matter of how the so-called victims could portray themselves. And I think this is the interesting point of all this. Harry and Meghan, for the last three years, two years, have portrayed themselves as victims. But they're the aggressors. They're the ones who constantly lob bombs at the royal family, whether through opera or Apple or Netflix or now the book uh, and all the interviews. It really is an astonishing act of treachery in my view. So I've been talking about the amazing extreme altitude wines from the Bonner Private Wine Partnership because they're back. They're back with an amazing offer from my audience. It's winter, of course, and these flavors happen to go great with any hearty meal and meat that you may be serving. They're unlike any wine that you've ever tasted. Blackberry, leather, smoke, little dark cherry in there. Don't you love dark cherry? Makes everything better. The wines are almost impossible to get on your own. The producers deep in the Andes Mountains make limited quantities. Today, I have an amazing offer that I've never had before. If you visit Bonner. B-O-N-N-E-R, privatewines.com slash M-K-S. You will not only get wine for over 50% off, plus free shipping, you will also get a bonus bottle of small batch limited production wine from their exclusive wine cellar. That's four bottles for the price of three. It's a deal that's hard to turn down if you're a wine lover like I am. They've cut out the middleman, so you're not going to pay a big markup. You just visit Bonner, B-O-N-N-E-R, privatewines.com slash M-K-S 
to claim your bonus bottle and become a part of America's most unique wine club. Try these wines and see for yourself. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.